Uh, hello, welcome everyone. We're, we're here this afternoon to do a candid conversation about COVID-19. Uh, this is Pastor Dan Erickson, and uh, we have as our guest today, Dr. Brian Thompson of Fairview Systems or whatever you are Fairview called. Fairview Masaba Clinic. Fairview yep. Masaba Clinic, and Representative Julie Sandstead of Hibbing. Uh, Julie will be kind of representing the government, uh, all the government, no, representing, giving a perspective of what the government is trying to do in containing the COVID-19 uh, virus. And uh, Dr. Thompson is here to give us a medical perspective. So it's my representative slash choir director since longtime friend, and my doctor, a fine doctor, I must say. <laughs> I, so I always look forward. But I will say, Dr. Thompson, I do think you missed your calling. You would have been a fantastic basketball coach. Well, thank I would you. Have, I, thank you. It's you something have, I enjoy very <laughs> much. A, this guy's a great basketball <laughs> coach, especially with, with the younger guys. And thank it's you. been fun to watch that. So um, we're here. And I am going to give you, I didn't warn you about this. I'm going to give you a chance to just say a, a couple uh, a paragraph or a paragraph or two for an opening uh, as far as just as you're dealing with this whole COVID-19, what's the, the main thing that's on your mind right now? Go ahead, Brian. Thanks, you can sir. go first. Thank you. I, I'm gonna call, can I call you Brian and Julie? Please, is please, that, please. Okay. <clears throat> Brian, go ahead first. Uh, um, th this is the first time in my life that I have felt the stress of social uh, 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 stressors, and, and th this actually feels very, very real to me. And for about the last week, it has become very clear to me, and for a f few weeks now to a lot of people, that we have to separate ourselves to slow this virus down. And the reason that we have to do that is because the hospital capacity is, is such that there's a percentage of people that will become critically ill, and there's a percentage of people that will need hospital and ventilators and medical supplies, and there's a finite amount of that. And so in this time right now, the advice that we're hearing on TV from everyone is social distancing, social distancing, and that is the main point that I wanna drive home today. There are many unknowns about this topic. There, it's, it's unknown the details of the virus, our medicine's gonna be available, our vaccine's gonna be available, those things are all unknown, but what is known right now is that the hospital system will become overwhelmed if we don't distance ourselves from each other and slow the spread of the virus. That's my main point today. Okay, thanks, Julie. Do you want to make an opening statement? I would echo everything uh, that was just said. From my perspective and my role, the things that are on my mind is to really encourage people to take the advice that we are being given extremely seriously um, and also uh, try to help as much as I can as life becomes tougher for small businesses, for educators, for students, for families, for people who are losing their income, um, to, to reach out and, and, and do what I can in the immediate moment to kind of share that load or lessen the burden, but then also make sure that I'm doing everything I can to have some kind of a safety net for them in the long run and to communicate to people who are now, you're going to start to see the concern ramp up a little bit to uh, just remind people, we're not going to have perfect answers today from the government, from administration. Uh, we are going to probably make mistakes, but you know we are going to not give up. We continue to work 24 hours a day around the clock to be looking for solutions. Um, and, to, and just remind people, if you take the advice you're being given and keep a cool head, this will get figured out. And the federal government is stepping in, the state government is stepping in. Um, I'm seeing a tremendous amount of bipartisan, bicameral work in our state which is exceptional. It should be that case. Everybody is committed to making sure people are okay. Um, and to reach out to me, reach out to your senator, reach out to your other state representatives if you don't live in my district, um, and let them know what's what you need, and we're there to help. Great. I meant, I meant to say earlier, our, our purpose here is to basically share the information and the understandings that the two of you have especially. And we recognize you're just 
each of you are just an individual and you certainly don't know everything, but you do have informed perspectives. And for the folks, uh, for the rest of us, that's what we need. We need information that will help us to make good and wise decisions and uh, trusting that, especially as, as Christians, that uh, caring for one another and uh, caring what happens not just to ourselves, but to our entire community is, is very important to us. Um, Let's go back a little bit, and maybe this is the, the most important question for some people. Dr. Brian, I, I've got this cough, <laughs> or I'm, I'm having you know, a little bit shortness of breath. When do, what do I do? When is it time to call my doctor, go to the emergency room, or, or what's the procedure I'm supposed to take if I'm not feeling well? Uh, if, do I need to have, a, if my fever's okay? Does, you know, what are some of the factors? That's a great question. Um, Again, uh, a, a little bit unknown, and there's a little bit of a inability to give firm, specific recommendations. The advice to call your doctor is good advice. Right now, what's happening? Will the doctor answer his phone? The, the doctor will not answer the phone, likely, but you will be placed in the hands of very capable triage nurses. And what they will do is they will ask you questions about your uh, symptoms. Now, um, most people know, but I'll reiterate it, COVID, or, uh, coronavirus is a virus. There are not antibiotics for this illness. And so when people get strep throat or a bacterial pneumonia or something, you need to have a medicine. But the vast majority of people, and it's not really clear what percentage that is yet, but the vast majority of people will get better with no treatment and no medical intervention. That helps people to feel more calm, I hope, but it also is very important for people to know that going to the doctor may simply unnecessarily put more people at risk, the people that are exposed to the virus. And so if you are mildly ill, cough, fever, um, maybe a little bit of a sore throat, there, there is something to be said about staying home and self-isolating, okay? And that self-isolation involves isolating in your home and also relative isolation from the people in your home. Your close household contacts will be at high risk to develop the virus if you have it at your home. But nevertheless, you have to do everything you can. Um, when you call me, when you call the doctor, you'll get in touch with a triage nurse and she's going to ask you a lot of these questions. I think it can be summarized as... If you are having fever and cough and you body aches, but you're breathing okay and you're all right, you should stay home. If you are having fever, cough, and shortness of breath, you should go to the emergency room. I think the telltale symptom for uh, uh, indicating that there may be an emergent or urgent situation in you is shortness of breath. This virus uh, causes what's called a, a viral pneumonia. Extra fluid gets produced and, and, and settles in in the lungs. And then what happens is you can't exchange oxygen. And, and, and that's where people uh, have to go to the hospital and, and, and get that medical support. So most people will be able to stay home. There are some people who will need medical attention, and that should be guided. Don't walk into your clinic. Don't walk into the emergency room. These facilities will be too busy, and, and it will cause too much difficulty. A phone call ahead of time to say, I have a cough and shortness of breath, and I'm coming in, and then people can direct you and be ready for you and all those things. Is, is it true? Do they meet you at the Fairview Hospital? Do they meet you outside the hospital right now? Is that... I, I, I'm over in Nashwalk every I'm day, so, sure but we actually have, I'm not sure exactly on that question, forgive me, but in, um, in Nashwalk, they've actually assigned someone to the door. And if someone has a fever and a cough or something like that and they need medical attention, they are actually directed to turn around, call the triage line, and get further instructions. Part of this is treating the sick. Part of this is protecting the well as well. Okay, yeah, and that's something, again, with something which is contagious and, and still lots of how contagious exactly, but it's very, con uh, on the scale, it's on the upper side. Of it appears to be very contagious, yes. And so that, that's a big concern of not sharing that disease with healthcare workers or with other patients or exactly. anything like that. So again, just go walking and sitting in the ER 
waiting room isn't a real good option. And, and, and that won't be done right now. That, that's part of the contingency and, and, and surge planning that the, every medical community yeah. is doing. And so if you encounter that, it's not because the people are trying to be mean or don't care about you. They're wanting to make sure everyone is protected. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Julie, let's go back to something I think both of you mentioned as far as the flattening of the curve and explaining that does, does this mean that we anticipate lots of people are going to get it no matter what we do, but we're trying to do our best to make sure they don't all get it at the same time, or can we keep people from getting it? I guess part of that's for Dr. Brian. But I was just going to say, you're the doctor. <laughs> um, for sure, this is not about stopping it. It would be about potentially potent, potentially lessening the number of people could get, who could get it. But ultimately, my understanding is to um, ensure that those who do contract the virus um, are going to have health care available to them that is going to be necessary and we're not going to overwhelm the infrastructure of our of our health care profession basically uh, and and I'll, I'll add to that too pastor if you if you if, if you watch the news you've seen that curve a thousand times you know they're showing it constantly very likely a high percentage of people in our society are going to get this virus if they all get it right away the health system becomes overwhelmed. If people distance themselves and there's a slower accumulation of patients that have this virus, then the health system can keep up with the demand. That's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the most important thing right now. Really? And the other thing that is always at play in the back of my mind is time is on our side when we do this. Um, the, even though it means kind of stretching out how long we might be dealing with this, medical advancements are taking place every single day. And certainly this virus has captured the attention of a global audience, basically. So we don't know what could be available next week, next month, two months from now. Um, and potentially that could start, there could be something that would start slowing down the number of people who would actually be contracting it. So we have to do whatever we can do, in my opinion, right now to not overwhelm and certainly just keep it manageable. Uh, maybe just let's talk about the, the current numbers, um, which I'm not sure I remember all of them. In the state of Minnesota, uh, there are 115 cases right now. Correct. And those are in the, mostly in the metro area, a few outstate, but none in northeastern Minnesota. Is that correct? That is of correct. Of confirmed cases. That is correct. And of course, confirmed involves testing and test results. Uh, let, let me ask you that. What, one question someone had was, is the fact we don't, uh, the, the reason we don't have any confirmed cases in northern Minnesota is because we're doing very little testing, is, is and that... There's maybe lots of cases, but we just haven't tested. Does that make sense to you? It, 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 it makes sense in a way, but I'm not certain of it. And, and that's, it, it's important that, you know, rumors don't, you know, it's important that I give accurate information. And, and I suspect that that may be true, but I definitely don't know it. I know just from watching, watching local news that in, in Duluth, they've done about between 80 and 100 tests, and none of them have come back positive yet. None, a lot of them are pending because there's been delays in the process of the testing. And so, um, it, 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 frankly, it's unknown. Um, and I think right now it, it is less than, I forget the person, less than 10% of the tests are positive, but is that saying, are the numbers those who have been tested and includes those whose results are not known, perhaps? I, I, I'm not sure of that. And, and it would be expected that for a respiratory illness, there would be a great deal of negative COVID tests because colds and, and, and other viral, viral upper respiratory infections and influenza are still making their rounds at this time. I would just state that um, the numbers are what they are today. They're updated at noon every single day. Uh, I highly suspect that 
there's testing being done that we just don't have those results yet. And so that's why each day we see them to continue to climb. I'm also going to share, it's my opinion, um, our numbers are probably an underestimate of really what's out there because there has been such a caution to uh, quick pull out a swab and, and check somebody. It's not strep, you know, it's different. Um, and so when you do go to a healthcare professional, they're very careful about screening you and not just uh, casually using this as a, a first, you know, measure test type Agreed. of thing. Agreed. And uh, let's see, in the United States, how many are there? I'm getting confused with my numbers. Is it 10? I think there's 10 and a half thousand. 10 and a half cases. thousand, yep. yes. And it just crossed 200 deaths. I was watching the news before I came okay. here. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So across 200 deaths in the United States. And then, of course, we have the worldwide figures. Um, I guess that's a whole other topic. And, and, and maybe I should bring this later, but what about, what are we learning from the experience in Italy and uh, Iran? Um, and other places, China and South Korea, are, is that helping us develop our policies or are, that's I guess for Julie, or are we making them more what we think is best for us or uh, how is that working? I'm glad you asked that question. I, I think one thing has become very clear to me as a policymaker. This virus and our response to it as a state has shown such a bright light across our state in terms of holes that exist. Holes, uh, you know, in housing, in broadband, which is something we talk about up here all the time, um, not having the same opportunity as other places in our states, access to food, access to health care. Um, now we're really seeing when we're trying to address our population as a whole, how we're doing it effectively or not so effectively. It's easier in some parts and not in others. Uh, in our area up here, broadband continues to just jump to the forefront for us. We have had to almost overnight go from in-person counseling treatments, medical treatments, to something like telehealth uh, in a very, very quick turnaround. Educators are currently trying to deliver um, ongoing education in a distance manner. And for some, that's going to mean electronic formats, and for others, it's going to be packets of paper. Um, but it's really shining a light. Uh, and, and I think we have a golden opportunity. When we come to the other side of this, and I believe we're going to come out to the other side without a problem, but it's going to be some time. And I shouldn't say without a problem, but when we get there, um, we're really going to have a responsibility of taking a hard look at this and then making sure at the very baseline we have fundamental in infrastructure in place for our population, young or old. I'll add to that, uh, Pastor. The, the, um, uh, I was on vacation last week. And I got to a work. fine time yeah, to take yeah, vacation. Yeah, yeah, I was on vacation last week. I uh, got to work. I was also off on Monday, and I got to work on Tuesday. And my schedule was. Did you travel to Rome for vacation? I did, I did not travel anywhere. I've, I'm, um, but the um, I got to work, and there were eighteen to twenty people on my schedule that morning. And I immediately got a slightly panicked. Um, and, and we, my staff is outstanding. And, and, and I, we were able to convert the vast majority of those visits over to telehealth visits. The rest of the week, I've done telehealth visits. Prior to this week, I have never done a telehealth visit. And, and so to, to, to speak to the, the changing times, and, and it's got to be weird for the patients when I when they're talking to me about their blood pressure and I'm saying, listen, it's 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 worse for you to come to the clinic than it is for me to check your blood pressure and refill your medicines and check your labs. I'm going to simply refill your medicine and then we're going to deal with the labs and everything else later. The social distancing trumps all of those um, 
all of those other kind of medical needs. Now, there are medical needs that come up that need attention, and we still have the capability to do those, but, but a great deal of patients are gonna be cared for remotely right now, and, and that's the best thing for our society. One of the things, as, as far as uh, patients, uh, we mentioned before we started recording that this is a problem for both uh, young and old. Uh, lots of attention has been focused on uh, older people, people with compromised uh, immune systems, but we were talking about younger people are getting COVID-19 as well. I, I, I can't stress this enough either. The, the data coming out of China, it was looking like the old were at much higher risk and the young seem to maybe get a mild illness and it isn't that big of a deal, more like a common cold. And it is, uh, it, forgive me, if I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I hope I'm remembering this right. 40% of the hospitalized patients in the United States are between the ages of 20 and 54. And we're talking 40%. And you don't get put in the hospital because you have coronavirus. The vast majority of these people go home the critically ill people get put in the hospital. 40% of the critically ill people are in that young age group. So the false premise that this is an old person threat and not a young person threat, I believe is absolutely false. And I'm gonna jump in on this one and just say, in my own family, I've got teenagers and we were all teenagers once where you're young and invincible um, and college age students, there's so many people that are still going on their spring breaks and, and gathering. And this, I'm, I'm very nervous that this is going to be a problem. Um, this is when the adults have to really work with our youth and understand their mindset, but just keep explaining and insisting on the social distancing and, you know, parents, it's hard to say no to your kids sometimes, but this is a time to say, no, it's time to stay home and, Thank goodness for cell phones and different things like that. They can still stay in contact, but physical proximity, we have to be careful about. Okay, we've, uh, that term social distancing has come up repeatedly. We've never quite explained what it is, um, but it's basically staying physically away from people uh, for at least for any more than a few seconds at a time. I mean, the, the longer you're in that close proximity, the more dangerous it or the more likely it is that you will pass on an illness. And that's why we are sitting separately here about six feet away from each other. And that's not our what we would, we would love if we could give a hearty handshake to pass to Dr. Brian and a big hug to Julie but we're just going to wave, you know, yep. friendly wave to each other. Um, and that's probably true for, uh, you know, almost any situation you're in. Now, maybe with your spouse, you can uh, decide, well, it's not worth it. We're going to, yep. we're going to, we're going to have some physical contact, but uh, yep. I'm uh, still hugging my kids. You're still too. hugging yep. your kids. I'm still keep, hugging keep, my keep, kids. And again, uh, the, the more cases you do that, the, you know, the more cases you keep the distance, the less, likely it exactly. will spread. And so maybe you have family members you're still going to choose to hug, but whoever you don't choose to have that relationship with will make it less likely. Is that? Uh, and and I, I would add that I hug my kids because I love them but I, I, and my wife, but I also am hugging and touching my kids and not afraid of it because we are in the same household. And if one of us gets it, it's more likely that the rest of us are going to get it. I love my mom to death. I'm not going to hug her. I, I'm going to stay six feet away from my mom right now. Okay. Six feet away okay. from my dad. I am staying six feet away from everyone. If you saw Heather and I out getting supplies on Friday last week, my hands are in my pocket and I'm, I, I, I am not myself. And that's how we all have to be right now. Um, we, it, it is odd to do. You've known me my whole life, basically, and I shake your hand and we touch and I touch your shoulder and everything like that. And I saw you today and I waved at you from six feet away and I pulled my chair up here and I haven't even come within six feet of, of you either. And I just met you and I've wanted to meet you and I would shake your hand <laughs> if I could. Another time. Yeah, exactly. You didn't even shake my hand. <laughs> yeah. what, what, do you, what do you do? Uh, well, I'll go to the summer. Julie, what do, what do you do when someone comes up to you and extends their hand? Well, that has slowed down significantly, so I haven't had to do that since I've really come home. Uh, back in St. Paul, I would just explain, you know, 
understand, I mean no offense, but uh, right now the recommendations are that we just uh, find another way. So high five with my elbow or or just joke about high fiving with my elbow and yeah. give them a smile and a nod. And of course, everybody has been very understanding of that. Everybody, is that true, everybody? Or do you, have you encountered people? What's wrong? It's all blowing, it's all, People are making a big deal of this, you know. No one's even gotten it up here, you know. No one I, has. Has anyone died? What's our how many deaths in Minnesota? I don't think we've had any. Death. I believe zero. Yep. Yeah, I zero, no one's aware. died from it. Why are we making such a big deal of it? I certainly had the skepticism on the initial onset of this. That has changed so dramatically as our lives have continued to change so dramatically in 24 hours. Uh, three days look significantly different. Uh, you and I had a conversation on the phone one night, and it didn't seem like this was too much, you know, going too fast, and that was not that long ago. And we're in a, we're in a totally different world today. Um, people who are skeptical, everybody is entitled to their own thoughts, um, I have the responsibility of keeping myself, my family, others safe. I absolutely believe with all of my heart that Minnesota is more fortunate than most places to have the professionals, the, the experts that we have with the Mayo Clinic in our backyard. Every piece of advice that we are getting is saying, don't blow this off as a hoax. We can look at other countries in the world that took it lightly at the onset, and they're in trouble. And their numbers, like uh, hospital beds and physicians per capita, far out exceeds, exceeds what the U.S. has. So maybe I'm a person who likes to play by the rules and stay in bounds, but um, this is not a time, in my opinion, to be pushing the boundaries on anything. And if this is the advice we're getting, great. I think it, we have every reason to uh, not be skeptical about it and take it at face value. If at the other side of this, you know, we can look back and say, well, maybe that wasn't necessary. Great. We learned something from this, but let's not have that experiment right now. If I can add to that, um, at the end of this, if our hospital systems keep up with everything and, and we have a good outcome in our society, it will be because we did this social distancing. It is clear that if we do not, we will end up overwhelming the hospital system. There is no question. If, and, and I'm not the doom and gloom type usually, but it, it is just clear to me right now. It, it, it is clear to you because of the experience in Italy and Iran? Why, why is it clear to you, I guess? It is clear to me because of the experience uh, throughout the world. Yes. Okay. Um, and we did talk about this a little bit before we uh, started recording, but I'm going to ask it again. How do people get COVID-19? Um, we're told that it can come from, again, personal contact and also in contact with surfaces that these people, someone touches uh, a box and another person touches the box. Um, is it true that of all the, in, I believe in the United States, all of the cases we have, have been, they've been able to trace to some type of personal contact? Is that true as far as... I, I don't know if that's true or not. That doesn't... Um, if I logically think about it, the virus can be transmitted from surfaces. Uh, yeah, I, I, that makes sense. Yes. My question is, how likely is that to happen? I think that's an unknown. I, I, I think that so is So then that known. becomes the question, should you pick up your mail in the mailbox? Um, that, that question has come up, uh, I've, I've become a total news junkie, even more than I used to be. And um, I, there was a virologist on NBC saying that you should leave it outside for 24 hours. And then Dr. Prabhu last night said, you can take your mail. And, and I think that is another one of those unknowns again. And so then what is he, what is he saying? You can take your mail because what? Um, because, I, you know, he didn't give a reason. 
All, 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 all he said <laughs> he'll, was, "You let yes. him speak to yeah. him for himself. <laughs> yep. You can do it, and I'm not telling yep. you why." Yep. And, and 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 there are other advice that are saying you have to use great caution. I think we should be using caution at all times with everything. When I was handed this microphone, I thought, "Ooh." But then I took the microphone because I'm, I'm in, this, in this format. But when I get done with this, I'm going to clean my hands and I'm trying not to touch my face and I'm trying to do all the recommended things. Okay. I had the same thoughts about the microphone. <laughs> um, we yell. Yell. <laughs> Thank you. They were all disinfected. Oh, good. At good. some point. Great. Before um, I gave them to you. <laughs> I think it's... Um, possible that people could try to be navigating these times and almost become paralyzed by what they should and should not be doing anymore. And I, I think that's happening. And, I and that's why I, I, I understand the words of caution and, and, and find myself in substantial agreement. But I see people who are petrified. They, they don't dare go to a grocery store to get food. Mm -hmm. Right. That's not good. Well, and I'm going to refrain from judging. I don't know everybody's underlying health condition or, or what they know about themselves. They have to be the ones to make that call. And hopefully, if they aren't feeling comfortable for whatever reason, there's somebody who can deliver a, a box of food or something to their door. We don't need to be paralyzed at this point. That is my, and you're the doctor, I'm the I agree. public servant here. Um, we don't need to be paralyzed, but we need to listen to the advice we're being given, which is very inclusive of wash your hands. So whether you pick up your mail or you're in contact, wash those hands, cover your coughs, um, you know, Social distancing, for sure. Common sense stuff. If you're not feeling well, stay home. Those are the the loud, clear signals, advice that we are being given. And, and they're solid, in my opinion. Um, but we don't need to be paralyzed. There's nothing indicating that I've seen globally where anybody else has absolutely given different instruction and said, come to a screeching halt, and we've seen the, the virus behave differently. So I think we're solid with the advice we've been given to date so far. So if so, is Menards open? Can you go to Menards? I was at Lowe's on Friday. Okay. So you would not, you would not hesitate to go to Lowe's to buy some supplies. I mean, you would, you would wash your hands. You would do different things. You went hug your your next door neighbor that you mm -hmm. saw there, but you would not hesitate to go and buy something there. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, I did wouldn't it. say that. Whether you hesitate or not, I, you I, did I, it. I, 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 I did go because we needed some things and we went and we did all of our errands, my wife and I, and then we haven't gone, you know, I, it's, it's tough because I go to a clinic every day. You know, I, I'm, I'm the worst case scenario for this. But I also, when I walk down this aisle, I might kind of touch the pews as I walked by a year ago, and today I will be conscious of my hands. I will be conscious of um, my cough. I will be conscious of, now that I touch this microphone, even though I'm certain it's clean, I'm going to try not to touch my face and I'm going to clean my hands, and I have a hand sanitizer in my truck, and those kind of things. I don't think we're paralyzed if we're cautious. I think it's reasonable to pick your mail out of the mailbox, open it up, check it out, clean your hands right after you're done with that because you just touch something that touched someone else. you don't else. know what... Yeah. Exactly. Just prior to coming here for this uh, conversation, my husband and I did some grocery shopping. And I cleaned the cart before I had to touch it. I cleaned it after I used it. Um, I don't have disposable gloves available, but I found myself wishing maybe I did, that that would be something I would never in my life prior to today have considered, but I found that thought going through my head. Um, I was also very conscientious that when I was looking at items on a shelf, I'll pick up two you know, next to each other and read the boxes or look at different things and compare, and I only touched what I took. And I was careful not to do more of that. Again, just it, this causes us to take pause and consider the things that we've never really thought about before. And not, not that we're, I certainly don't anticipate that we're going to live like this forever or that we will have to. But for now, 
err on the side of caution. It's not any skin off our and, nose. And there are some people who live that during the cold, at least during the cold and flu season, live that way. Yep. Always. Yep. <laughs> sure. You yep. know, the, sure. I mean, Walmart has had wipes to disinfect their carts for exactly. years. You exactly. Know, right. um, um, let, let me let me go to some more specific questions that others have asked. They've sent them in, and and uh, which is also a signal. Maybe I'm running out of the questions I want to ask. Um, the number of questions are about well, how long is this going to happen? I, is there any way to say we expect the peak at this point? You know, or you know, based on what happens, we expect the peak at this point. How, people are asking, how long is school going to be closed? Um, how long are businesses going to be closed? How long are restaurants going to be closed? It, I guess, Julie, you're the, when, when, is, when are they going to let Valentini's be open on Friday night? I don't have that answer. Um, for the time being, restaurants are you know, allowed to operate on a curbside or pickup basis. And I do want to say this is a great time for those who are able um, to support their local businesses this way. This is something we can all do together around those businesses and communities. That's not everybody's option, and I, I'm painfully aware of that. Um, but for those that can, we should. You, you would dare to eat food someone else has prepared and carried out to the car? I'm not. <laughs> yes, I'm not. I would too. Okay. As far as schools, um, I think we're in for a longer haul than... Uh, people are really talking about, I think, until we understand how this virus is behaving a little bit better, um, we just need to be flexible and adapt to a very changing delivery of education. Um, and education isn't stopping. It's going to look different. My job isn't stopping, but it's looking different. All of ours are. Um, but I think as far as when are the kids going to go back into a facility, I'd say it could be a while. I know that colleges, higher education systems are already making the call to uh, only deliver education online for the remainder of the school year. I'm moving my son home tomorrow. Um, his room is packed up. They may or may not be checked out in person. And uh, the rest of his his semester is going to be done so, online. So it's, I guess I was under the impression that local schools have, local K through 12s have already made that decision as well. Is, is that a misimpression that there will, that the students will not be back in the building uh, this school year? I think that's rumor I, that hasn't been confirmed. Okay. Um, and, the, and the state hasn't given any either mandates or guidelines. The state has only said for the next eight days, I think through March 27th was the date uh, that teachers should be working together, staff should be working together, and together doesn't necessarily mean physically in proximity, but coming up with a plan for um, what distance learning is going to look for them, what it'll look like, whether it's packets, if it's going to be curriculum delivered um, through an online format, you know, I'm not sure, but in educators were instructed eight days to prepare with the understanding that school probably won't be open in eight days. And so you'll be delivering under a new method. Indefinitely. <laughs> um, let's see, you've answered many, of, you've answered many of these without realizing it. Uh, I guess we had to touch on a little bit. I mean, we do and we anticipate that things will become even more strict. And I think it was the uh, the headline was the governor said uh, Minnesota may eventually need to have a um, I forget what they call it when you have shelter in place. Sheltered in place. It, that to you seems realistic, Julie. It does, and I say that not because I've got some inside scoop on anything, but when you look at what's happening in our nation in terms of cities where they're kind of hitting their peak, 
uh, the Bay Area, New York, different places like that, they are being asked to shelter in place. Our governor has been very clear um, from the get-go that this is a very fluid situation. He is addressing things uh, in a time frame that is appropriate. He's being he is very proactive. Um, some people think it's over the top. I think it's genuinely being proactive. Um, and so I, I know from the day that uh, he ordered like talked about things looking different for schools and then actually closing schools was only about a three day period. Um, restaurants, bars had less than 24 hours notice. Um, so things do move very, very rapidly. While we're not at a shelter in place scenario today, I think that could be coming shortly. Um, especially in areas that are seeing multiple cases, you know, of positive tests in their areas. And that's, again, not because of any inside scoop, but that's what we are seeing uh, being practiced in other states. And our governor is watching that carefully, and he is erring on the side of caution. So it would not be a surprise. I think we should all be prepared genuinely for uh, significant interruptions in the lifestyles that we have been living as we've known them. It's going to look different um, and for sure be prepared for major inconveniences, but I do anticipate everything will be back on track eventually. I'm just laughing because I'm thinking of the old saying, Julie, in the long run, we're all dead. So <laughs> what, what eventually means is... <laughs> I hope... <laughs> before, that's it, true. Within your lifetime, within your lifetime, you well, expect... Well, sooner it. than later. And I think, yeah. um, I think... I think that if... This is me speaking again. I think that we should be looking through spring, uh, early summer, things will have quieted down. I also would anticipate that come this fall, we'll see an uptick of this again. So we just need to learn from this and prepare and, and be flexible. Uh, Dr. Brian, do you, do you concur with that, that uh, we might see a down in the summer months and then an uptick in the fall? Is that is that inevitable or likely or? Definitely not. It, there, there isn't any ability to know that. The, the, this is a novel virus. It's a new virus. It, it, the first cases were in December. We've had through, uh, you know, three months now in the world, and, and, and it's striking the whole world. It is present in countries that are in their summer months or has been present in countries in their summer months. So mm -hmm. I definitely don't think we can count on it going away in the summer. Do, do you... Do you believe, this is off topic a little bit, do you believe in China they have stopped that they are not getting new virus, new cases? No, no, and not because I think the government is being dishonest. I, I think that they may not have had any new cases in Wuhan yesterday or the day before when that news yeah. came out, but I definitely don't think that this is going to be um, uh, uh, eliminated from, from Chinese society. And keep in mind that China did an absolute lockdown. This was... Um, you know, e even by our standards in New York and California where we're doing these lockdowns, I believe China's lockdown was much more strict and, and enforced and enforced, unfortunately, on the news with, with force sometimes, you know, and a little bit yeah. draconian. But that um, they, they slowed it down and they're uh, uh, showing the benefits of that social distancing now. Um, that's. But I, I do think as they resume society again, it'll start circulating again. That's just logical with viral behavior. Okay, just just one other question along the international <clears throat> speculation. Is, in my understanding is that in South Korea, they did a lot more testing, identified the people, quarantined them, but had other people who uh, were not did not have the illness pretty much had a lot more freedom. Is that is that your understanding of what, what happened there, that a very strict quarantine of those who were affected? The, I, I understand, and, and this, uh, I, I, I do not have, the, 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 this is my understanding, I do not know this, that um, widespread testing and strict quarantine of positive cases was beneficial to the countries that this hasn't hit as hard. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that the, Early testing was the key. Unfortunately, I believe that we are are, are past I'll that past opportunity that, yeah. now. Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, 
To be an interviewer like this, it helps to be like in your 40s so your mind doesn't forget the questions that you're <laughs> about to ask. Uh, oh, and something you said, Julie, was, uh, so, oh, this isn't a question. This is a question, but it's just my hope, my declaration. Just as long as we can, the NFL season can start in September, <laughs> then we'll be okay, right? And life goes on. <laughs> life goes on. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, you know, I used to be a big baseball fan, but I'll live without baseball if we have to, but the NFL must start. Uh, here was a specific question uh, from a, uh, this is a healthcare worker I know. Um, uh, first of all, she was, uh, how long after, um, be, or once the person is asymptomatic, has kind of passed through the, uh, the symptoms of the virus, when then are they no longer contagious? Do we know that, Dr. Bryan? I, I don't. I, I, I've been re reviewing and reading, and, and my two primary sources, and I, I think this, everyone should do this, cdc.gov and MDH, Minnesota Department of Health, those are the reliable, up-to-date information. I, I, I'm not into social media at all, but uh, there's a lot of news out there in different well, formats. Well, I thought you just didn't want to be my friend yeah. on Facebook. You're <laughs> no, not even I never, on there. I never, oh, I'm okay. not even on there. But there, there is a lot of information that isn't reliable. And actually, when you watch like the press conference every day, uh, the the you know Dr. Fauci and and the president and the vice president, they are. You'll hear Dr. Fauci say a thousand times, we don't know that yeah. yet. We don't know that yet. Um, the CDC and the Minnesota Department of Health put out reliable information that people can count on. From my understanding, 72 hours after resolution of fever without anti-fever drugs, so not, not I don't have a fever because I took Tylenol, but I don't have a fever, and my symptoms are improving, the contagiousness goes way down. The difficulty with this whole thing and the reason for the social distancing is because it's thought quite strongly that people with zero symptoms can be shedding virus and passing it on to others, which is the reason. It's not that you don't just shake hands with someone who's got a cold or a cough. You don't, you, you social distance universally because of that fact. And because of the fact that for the 14 day I mean, that someone with the virus may be asymptomatic for 14 days, up, up to 14 days. Yes. That's not every case. It's between two and 14. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's the uh, highlights, again, the unknowns of yeah. this. So it could be. So, you know, the fact that they're perfectly healthy today may not mean they don't have the virus. And, and those, those symptoms may be there. Um, very quickly, uh, don't take ibuprofen. Is that, is that, that's what the French are saying. Too, too um, early to say. Uh, the, the CDC says that the science is not clear on that. Okay. I, Dr. Fauci is interesting. I, I didn't, I never heard of him before now. Maybe you were aware of him. I again. wasn't, no. And he, there's something about him that gives him this, people trust him mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Although uh, the, there was a CNN story that a lot of people still aren't, it was something like roughly half of people are not following the social distancing type of, Part, recommendations. Part, part of the reason I was excited to do this today is so that I can pass that message on. Please. Yeah. And it's not obviously, obviously, these are two individuals. They're not part of any conspiracy. No. They're, they're oh, too yeah. low on the totem pole <laughs> to be part of any conspiracy. And they're very, they're intelligent people. And they're saying, take this seriously. Take this seriously. It's not a, it's not a plot to get you to, you know, whatever, but it's the real thing out there. Uh, Julie, I was going to, this was the question I forgot. I, I'm just curious, um, the, the Minnesota Department of Health, I mean, does the governor pretty much, what do you guys recommend? Let's do it. I, I mean, or are there others who are having input in there or, or how does, where does the Minnesota Department of Health fit into the structure, I guess? So the Minnesota Department of Health is following the CDC quite closely. Um, all leaders in the state right now are in significant communication with one another. Um, so certainly Commissioner Malcolm and the governor and their, you know, staff, they are in ongoing conversation. The leadership of the House, the leadership of the Senate, they are in ongoing conversation. Other commissioners um, are, are part of this uh, 
they're watching, so many sources are watching this so closely, and information is getting fed constantly up the pipeline. Ultimately, I think that this is falling um, primarily between Jan Malcolm, her staff, her recommendations based on what they're seeing in the state. Uh, you know, different healthcare centers across our state are, are going to them with information. And then she's making that in, or she's making that decision with the governor and the staff. And you mentioned this earlier, Julie. I think it is interesting, especially for those who are, are skeptical. Um, this is something that, at least in the, in the political realm, there is, I cannot think of a, a, a skeptic. I mean, someone who is saying, oh, this is all, you know, this is all fake. Don't, don't worry about it. It seems like across the board, everybody, you know, there may be disagreement about particulars and, and things, which are always, <laughs> because we don't know. But as far as this is a serious crisis, we need to take action. We need to take actions, which may seem rather drastic, because we have to do something, number one, to flatten the curve, if nothing else, to flatten the curve. And yeah, it was just yesterday that your former colleague, Congressman Omar, uh, spoke very highly of the actions of President Trump, and I don't think that has ever happened before. So, so we're making news here that uh, everyone agrees this is serious. Who is in in that position? And again, uh, that represents a wide variety of people. And so, I think people who are informed, who are you know, talking to people involved in the whole process, are realizing this is serious stuff. I mean, do you have? Would you say that's true of your all your colleagues in the Fairview Clinic? They all agree this is serious stuff we are all hands on deck full on surge preparation um, we are preparing for a complete change in the way that <clears throat> our health care is delivered i would anticipate that in the next few weeks i may not be in my clinic uh, seeing patients for high blood pressure and diabetes i may be in the emergency room in full protective equipment diagnosing and helping treat and triage uh, COVID-19 patients. That's my, okay. Uh, okay. I, I think universally, we're all anticipating that. Okay. Um, go ahead, Julie. I was just going to say, you know, we're certainly at the point where people understand regular dental appointments have been canceled, elective surgeries and elective procedures are canceled. Uh, down in the metro area, part of our... Uh, legislative and Senate, or House and Senate staff are also physicians. They are all in the emergency rooms now. Uh, men have to shave their beards. They have to, I mean, it's just, it, things look very different in terms of addressing this um, and, and being available. In the House of Representatives, we have to, we are, we're not in St. Paul anymore. We had a person uh, in the House. I don't know if it's an elected, a staff person, a whomever who was tested positive. Um, so we're not even, we're conducting our business in a very, very, very different I way. I think it was a guest chaplain, I heard. <laughs> I hope not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Um, so we're, we're having to do things very, very differently. Uh, voting, we have to be in extreme distance from one another. Uh, attendance. Some people are on the floor, some people are not, and you, I mean, it looks very different. Um, if anybody wants to think that this is something other than what we're talking about, I guess that's on them, but really we're giving the information that we're giving to protect not only ourselves, but this is to protect other people. I think we have become so accustomed in ways we never even realized of being so self-centered about us and we think about our health, but my keeping the distance isn't just about my health, it's about your health and about his health and about your health. I don't know, you know, John Q. Public, I don't know what underlying conditions they have. We have an obligation to humanity to take this seriously. That's good. Yes, Brian's safe up there. He's, uh, he's about, what, 150 <laughs> feet away from us? You get to clean the mics, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, couple, this, a couple more for Dr. Brian here. Uh, should skilled nursing facilities be bringing in COVID-19 patients for rehab if they don't have positive cases in the facility? Well, I, I don't think I can answer that one confidently. I can say 
that once the infection has cleared, if a patient was critically ill and they were in the hospital, they may need some rehabilitation and that may likely come up. And I think that that will have to be figured out as as um, of how long as the, the situation develops, how the, long they've been contagious. It's the same person who's asking that question. They may have been following up for that reason. Yeah. Well, I think as the availability of testing increases, that will be an easier question to answer because then we can do what often isn't done in the medical world, but what's called a test of cure, which means they test after they've had the illness. Now they test negative. I would be much more confident having that person in the nursing home. Nevertheless, I would still want some type of separation or precautions done, even in that situation. But I, 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 I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. I certainly don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. How about uh, there was? How about the healthcare workers themselves? If if they have a COVID nineteen patient and they simply don't have the equipment, the protective equipment. What, what do they do? We're supposed to quarantine for 14 days right now. And as time goes on, I know that will be an evolving situation too. Um, the difficulty is, and this is maybe unique to up here. I, I don't know if it's statewide. I believe it's statewide. And Julie, you may know. Um, the Minnesota Department of Health, I think it was two days ago, told us to, we are only testing hospitalized patients, healthcare workers, and nursing home residents, nursing home patients, because of the lack of testing. So with that, it becomes a little bit more difficult to answer questions because you, do, you don't have that testing availability. Okay. Um, thank you guys. Those are hard questions. I mean, they're not easy questions to answer. Sometimes you haven't given the best hand. No, you, you admitted that, yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, are there other things that you want to say before we close this afternoon? Billy, go ahead. Uh, social distancing. That, that, you, I've heard that before. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I told myself that the point I wanted to drive home was that everyone's got to respect that. And I know exactly what you're saying about, you know, do we need to paralyze ourselves? How far does this got to go? What do we, and, 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 and it is a consciousness of it at all times. It is hand hygiene. It is the way that you will get it if I have it is you will get my respiratory droplets on you. Even speaking, a little bit of spit comes out, right? When we're six feet apart, that's less likely. And so the social distancing is the most important thing right now. If you're sick, contact the healthcare system. I know on the local news, St. Luke's and St. Mary's both have hotlines you can call to get to a, a triage nurse or a provider. Uh, Fairview has a, a system in place that I don't know the phone number or information offhand, but I, I know it can be found, forgive me for that. But every health system is developing ways to try to triage and appropriately uh, funnel patients to the appropriate place. It is critical right now that we don't expose people if we can avoid it. I'm asking you one more question. I'm sorry. Sure. And we talked about within your family, if one person gets it, um, do you try to again isolate? Uh, I've already got a plan. Quarantine? I'm going to go live up in the loft if I get it at work. Okay. You know, and I, 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 I'm of course going to try not to get it at work, but I would be in the higher risk population. And if I do get it, I'll have to be at home for probably 14 days, and I will go stay up in the loft. And Heather will put my food on the bottom of the stairs, and I'm going to stay away. Yep, I am. Okay. <clears throat> Julie. Well, again, certainly... Um, I'm, not, I'm not asking what you're going to do with your, with your family if you get the, the, the virus. Well, anything you know, else you want to say? I would just say I, I really urge people to um, not be judgmental during this time, to understand that healthcare politicians, whomever, we are all putting our very best forth, and it's not going to be perfect, but we are doing the best we can with the information we have today in a very evolving situation. I think it's also a great time just to really encourage people to be gentle with one another, to be non-judgmental, to find an inordinate amount of patience, especially when kids are going to be home for long periods of time, to remember that this is probably as difficult for them as it is for us, maybe even more so um, for 
kids who have become accustomed to go, 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 do, 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 um, and, and teenagers and how important their social groups are and to have all of that kind of come to a screaming halt is a big adjustment for people to be creative and how uh, you can still connect with one another, either through social media, um, musically, uh, just in conversation, uh, Skyping, you know, not to forget the elderly, be very cognizant of people who are losing loved ones during this time. Uh, a good friend of mine, her father passed away yesterday and they can't come home. They can't be with one another right now. Um, and they can't have a funeral. And they even can't if do they that could. either. So, I mean, this, there are people that are, we're going to see humanity stretched to limits that are not familiar to me for sure. Maybe others, but not in my lifetime. And um, to do our best and to just be able to say it's okay. You know, we don't have all the answers. And yeah, and I think you've stated well that we need to really cultivate the civility that we've been losing a little bit. And it's really important that we regain that civility to deal with uh, the different things going on. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Brian Thompson, Representative Julie Sandstead, for, again, sharing your understandings, your opinions, just individuals, but they're uh, informed opinions, and we surely appreciate that. And I hope that uh, the things you've heard uh, during this conversation are helpful to you. Again, helping you be better informed in knowing how to respond in a responsible and loving way to the people around you. So thanks for watching. Have a great, safe day.